Hi, I'm Mr. Levier and I'm here at the University of Ottawa. We're going to learn about the amazing work they do here. Uh, they can actually date objects that are thousands of years old. This Accelerator Mass Spectrometry Laboratory is Canada's National Centre for Environmental Radioisotope Analysis and research that addresses issues of national interest and economic impact. This facility measures trace concentrations of radioisotopes and other rare elements that exist in the environment from natural sources and from human activities. We will meet AMS physicist Dr. Albert Zondervan and radiocarbon lab manager Sarah Mercelli. Hi, uh, my name is Albert Zondervan and I work as physicist for the La Lolle AMS laboratory here at the University of Ottawa. So uh, I will try to uh, give you a flavor of what we do here and what instruments we use for that. In essence, uh, the instruments I will be talking about is, uh, have to do with mass spectrometry. Uh, mass spectrometry is a very large field or in analytical chemistry uh, where you try to understand um, processes whether it's a process in a laboratory with samples or where you um, want to understand what the samples in nature particularly have gone through. Uh, to do those studies uh, you need to take samples, you need to see what the materials have gone through, what process it has gone through, and taking samples and analyzing these samples is helpful, very helpful, because they give you the, the bits and pieces of information that you can then try to understand in terms of the processes. Um, now, stepping back to what's happening here in this area, is that we use mass spectrometry to identify uh, these processes by their so-called isotopic signature. Is isotopic is that um, use of the word isotope. Isotopes are um, belong to a single element. So if you have carbon for example, carbon 12 carbon-13 and carbon-14 are all carbon isotopes, three of the same element carbon. And the interest in mass spectrometry is to determine how much of carbon-12 is there relative to carbon-13 and relative to carbon-14. So these so-called abundances, relative abundances between these isotopes gives a fingerprint of your sample and therefore an understanding, a bit of information towards understanding the natural process. So, isotopic fingerprinting could be the word that you may want to remember here. But in order to make that fingerprint you need to measure it, you need to measure those isotopes. And that's where the whole field of mass spectrometry is all about. Now in this particular case, where I'm standing right now, the emphasis is on measuring carbon-14 relative to carbon-12 and carbon-13. You've heard of carbon dating. It is one of those applications of doing such measurements. And how does it roughly work? Well, carbon-14 is a very, very rare isotope in the sense that its concentration, its natural abundance, is a million times, a million lower than that of carbon-12. So you need to do your very, very best to be able to see that very weak signal in your sample. Carbon-12 versus carbon-13 is only a factor of 100 from each other. It's relatively easy to measure. But for C14, the carbon-14, to be able to detect that you need to do quite an effort. And that effort starts here in this loading dock where the samples are mounted. If you take your camera down there, if you look from the top, you can see there a 
tray of samples sitting and they are inserted under vacuum into an iron source. That iron source is right here, this big block is the iron source and it contains a device that converts some of the graphite, the sample graphite, into a stream of carbon ions. So you make carbon ions from the carbon containing sample. Oh, carbon ions, do I select only the carbon 12? No, you collect all the carbon ions for all the three isotopes. And you're going to do your very best to measure C12 intensity versus C13 intensity. And in particular, your very best to do the very weak counting of C14. So, in order to be able to do all those things, you need various so-called filters. We don't talk about filters much, but effectively that's what they are, because you have a negative ion source for making negative ions here of the carbon. Then you have here a magnet, a little electromagnet. Then a little acceleration stage in here that converts the negative ions into positive ions. Another electromagnet right here. Then the carbon-12 and the carbon-13 are counted in so-called Faraday cups. They're basically little beakers on the side sitting here and here that allow you to let these ions fall into and, and, and use a small uh, electronic current. And uh, these currents are measured by these cables here, by the way, but it's already a detail. And then here is the last so-called filter, which is an electrostatic plate or two electrostatic plates that have an uh, electric field between them and that uh, filters out all the stuff that is not C14. So only the C14 then arrives at this point and then here we have a little sensitive device, a so-called particle detector that can register individual C14 atoms arriving one by one. That gives us the ultimate sensitivity for the carbon-14. Uh, a similar system we have here. Its platform, its footprint is, is, is much larger uh, because it can do not only carbon dating measurements but also a lot of other isotopic systems. Okay, but principally it is the same. It works in the same way. We start here with a sort holding samples uh, for making negative ion beams. So in here, in this chamber, is a large carousel holding our samples of interest. Then we have an ion source in here uh, with high voltage components and also a hot filament that allows us to make from the samples a stream of negative ions. And then in vacuum, the stream of negative ions is transported through various elements uh, and over, over there you see a big electromagnet uh, with the sticker from the company that we purchased this system from and it transports it towards that grey tank over there. That grey tank, that large grey tank is, uh, is the particle accelerator. So this Acceleration step is essential to create the sensitivity for the measurement. With the smaller accelerator where we just were, we had a very small stage, a very compact stage of acceleration, helping us to get rid of the interfering isobars or the beams that we don't want. But with this system, it's much larger because we're going to do a lot more acceleration. And why do you say, Oh, if you can do it with a small voltage, why are you going to such a big system with millions of volts? Well, because we want to, we want to do more than carbon dating. We want to be able to do other isotopic systems like chlorine 36, brilliant 10, and actinides. So all the way to uranium and plutonium, we want to figure out the isotopic abundances 
of certain isotopes in the, for the heavier elements. They are of particular interest as well. Maybe not so much for carbon dating or for dating in general, but for determining natural background radio, uh, radioactivity. The natural background radioactivity is everywhere around us and by, again, by focusing on these uh, uh, demonstrations of uh, natural radioactivity, we can learn more about the Earth system. Not only climate change, but in general about what is happening to our planet. And also figuring out what is our, our effect, what is the anthropogenic effect on the Earth system. Okay, so there's lots of application areas and I would like to show you uh, the chart of nuclides that we have here on the floor and we can give you a sense of what this machine can do in principle. So here we have every little square showing uh, the configuration for uh, a nuclide. Uh, and the number behind it is the mass number. So you see here the mass numbers are changing and right underneath the isotopic signature of, of that nuclide you have uh, written the, the, um, the degree of radioactivity. This is the half-life of this particular nuclide. The half-life is, is basically a single parameter uh, showing how stable or unstable uh, this nuclide is. This particular one is very unstable because if you have a certain number of these atoms then 110 milliseconds later you roughly have only half of them left. That's only a fraction of a second. If you get closer towards this sort of <coughs> ridge with black labeled nuclides, you see that the half-lives are getting longer and some of them don't have a half-life anymore and these are the nuclides that are not radioactive. They are stable, the stable nuclides. So, having sort of given you a flavor of stable and unstable nuclides and the whole chart of the nuclides here that are in principle available to us to study, to make use of. Let's now focus on the isotopes that we can measure with this mass spectrometer measurements. So it starts with a very low end. We can do with the system tritium measurements. Tritium is this symbol H3. It's radioactive and it is one of those isotopes that are um, that appear in nature as natural backgrounds. The next one we can do with the system is an isotope called beryllium-10. Beryllium-10 has a half-life of 1.5 million years and by measuring these two isotopes together on samples we can learn something about again natural processes and it's typically beryllium-10 and beryllium-9 are together measured with the system on samples of geological interest. The next one uh, we could talk about is um, for example sodium-22 but um, but the main one that uh, we do here is actually aluminum-26 measurements. So aluminum has one stable isotope of mass-27. It has, but its lighter brother, aluminum-26, is unstable but has a fairly long half-life and can also be used in the field of geomorphology. And sometimes the combination of multiple isotopic systems gives you additional extra information. Anyway, along this ridge of stable nuclides, you have several unstable ones that you could measure, attempt to measure by accelerated mass spectrometry. The next one that we do here is chlorine 36. Technetium 99 
is here uh, and then we're arriving here in the field of the actinides uranium and and plutonium here it requires a lot of different people to collaborate and to come up with the best plan execution interpretation the end product is of course the writing of papers the publications and the sharing of knowledge with the wider public then uh, you can think of you know that science can be exciting and uh, hard but rewarding okay thank so, you so much this is okay. awesome okay good 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 excellent my name is Sarah Merselli. I'm the laboratory manager at the AE Lalonde Radiocarbon Prep Lab. And what do we have here? So here's some examples of some materials that uh, we would work with, uh, that our, our users would submit for radiocarbon analysis. So we deal with a wide array of materials, anything from uh, bone to wood, charcoal, peat. Um, those would be organic containing and then also inorganic so shell uh, samples speleothem so we, we deal with a wide array of materials in the lab and what do we have here with these uh, samples so this would kind of be um, a good example of the life cycle of samples as they're received in the lab so submitters would send us uh, material that they've picked out interested to date. So here's some wood fragments um, or some, some bone fragments. And we would clean up the material and put them through various uh, physical and chemical pretreatments to isolate the exact compound we're interested to date. So this would be extracted bone collagen or cleaned up uh, wood samples after going through a series of, of chemical washes to remove any mobile uh, carbon that might contaminate your sample. And then following the pretreatment, all samples are converted to CO2, purified CO2, uh, by combustion. And we seal this with a torch and a brake seal. And then samples are converted to graphite. Um, we add CO2 plus hydrogen in the presence of an iron catalyst uh, converts to graphite or elemental carbon plus water so we remove the water from that reaction and then that tiny bit of graphite about one milligram of carbon is pressed into a target and that's what we measure on the AMS wow that's tiny <laughs> yeah it's about one millimeter diameter and that's what gets inserted into the ion source it's sputtered with cesium uh, produces negative carbon ions, and that's what's measured uh, on the AMS system. Radiocarbon has a half-life of about 5,700 years. Um, after about 10 half-lives, so 50,000 years, there's just so little radiocarbon remaining in the sample, uh, it's decayed away and, and we can't measure it reliably. So our age range is, uh, it goes back to about 50,000 years. 50,000 years, yeah. wow. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, you showing me this.